will turn the clocks back an hour and everybody shows up to church on time. I love it. <laughs> we should do this every week. That's actually what I was thinking this morning in bed. Uh, we should do this every day. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. Uh, as I introduce the series, I want to go ahead and ask all the kiddos. I'm going to need some help again today. So I'd love for all the grade schoolers and middle schoolers, if you could come up and maybe uh, sit in a circle up here on the stage with me. And I'm not above bribery. <clears throat> We're going to talk about giving today. So hopefully you brought all your Halloween candy. <laughs> All right, I need all the grade schoolers and middle schoolers up here. We are going to talk about giving for the next month. And I just want to really be upfront about it because a lot of our popular culture thinks that uh, the church likes to talk about money, and we don't. <laughs> The church does not like talking about money, and the church does not talk about money very often, despite public opinion. My opinion is that the church doesn't talk about money near enough. Amen. Because money is such an important part of our lives, in order to be healthy people following Jesus, we have to talk about money. We have to be open about it. We have to be willing to challenge each other on it and to see what God really says about our money. And I promise you right here and right now, I will not talk about money more than Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus talks about money almost as much as he talks about love. It was a major topic of his teaching. And a church that doesn't talk about money probably does it because they are not using money very healthily. Honestly. When churches don't talk about their money, I get concerned. I'm like, what's wrong? Why aren't they being open and upfront about how much money they're getting and how they're spending it? Uh, if, if we're not talking about it openly and honestly, something's not, not quite right. And I love that Pastor Chuck has a vision. I just met with him for coffee this week right before he left and he is working hard. One of his top priorities is establishing a clear uh, church budget for every ministry and a way that we can report back to the church how all of the, our funds are being used. Amen. And I, one of the things I want to do this morning is to pave the way. We're going to address a couple things that we need to address financially as a church. Um, but even more importantly, we need to look at God's Word, what He tells us about money. And I have the privilege of going all the way back to the Old Testament, which is my great joy. I am a Bible nerd. The Old Testament is my jam. You probably don't hear that very often, but... <clears throat> We're adding giving. So in, in this series that we have stretched throughout our church transition, the first several things that we did is we talked about how are we going to live out our faith, right? How are we going to let our souls out? And first we talked about how we live out our faith through our words, right? Through prayer, praise, and testimony. And then this last month, we started talking about fellowship, how do we live out our faith in community? It's not easy to be open and to trust broken, sinful people. <laughs> it's not, it takes faith to relate to each other and to trust each other as a church or as a small group. And this month, we're going to add giving. Because another great indicator of how big your faith is, is how you use your money. It's the world we live in. So together, is this all the grade and middle schoolers we have today? I don't think so. 
I need, I need more grade and middle schoolers because I want us today, we're going to pretend that we are a Jewish family. So we need to have a big Jewish family. And we're going to travel all the way back to the Old Testament. Well, that's, we need a mom. <laughs> we're going to travel all the way back and we're going to look at their ancient principles of giving, specifically related to tithes, offerings, and alms. Ancient principles of giving. And we're going to do that... <laughs> I don't know if you can see this chart over here. You guys are all probably too young to know Jeopardy. But here we have tithes, we have offerings, and we have alms. And we have categories. These points mean nothing. <clears throat> we have tithes for 100, tithes for 200, tithes for 300, tithes for 700. It's like the daily double. But we can't do that until we've gone through the whole category. Okay? So what I'm going to need your guys' help with is we're going to take turns picking one of these things for the sake of time, unfortunately, because I always have way too much that we can actually do. Uh, I'm going to have to say we're not going to cover offerings this morning. Okay, So you guys can choose from the tithes category or the alms category. And each of you is going to pick one, and then we're going to talk about it. How did a Jewish family practice those things way back in their ancient cultures? Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. You want to pick one of those up there, man? Tithes or alms? Which one? Alms for 100, 200, or 300? 300. Okay. Alms for 300. Let me ask you, though, uh, uh, what do you think are alms? I don't know. Don't know? Any guesses? No guesses. Alms for 300. Alms for 300. What is an open hand? An open hand. So back in Jewish culture, they were all, if you remember, when they were moving to their new country, they were all slaves in Egypt, right? So they didn't have a lot. They didn't have iPods. They didn't have cars. They had to walk across the desert, and they had to carry everything that they owned. So when they finally got to their country and their family found a piece of land and they started their farm, uh, they didn't have much to share. But this is a passage we have here in Deuteronomy. God told them as they were getting ready to start their new country, if among you one of your brothers should become poor, as if they weren't all poor already, Maybe some of them, as in every culture, some of them were poorer than others. In any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. You shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it is. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, Well, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And then he would cry to the Lord against you, and you would be guilty of sin. All right, so what did you guys hear? <clears throat> what is an open hand? Any ideas? Giving without what? Without reservations. without reservations. Now, when you say giving, what do you mean? Because <laughs> there's a couple interesting things in here. He didn't say give, I don't think, in our translation. What did it say? 
Lend. What does lend mean? Are lend and give different things? Yes. Absolutely. He said lend to your brother whatever it is. And it's interesting too, did you hear there was something in there about a seventh year? Do you know that in our Jewish family, that if we were to be poor, and if we had to go into debt to get food, or to get a new plow, if we went in debt, and we would slowly start paying that off, but if we got into trouble and we couldn't pay that off, every seventh year in Jewish culture was the year of release. And that's when the debts were forgiven. So if we couldn't pay it off in seven years, then on the seventh year, they would write off our debt and we wouldn't have to pay it back. So in this passage, he's saying, lend to, to your poor brother, right? Your struggling neighbor. Lend him anything he wants and expect him to pay it back. Right? Expect him to pay it back. Just like if we borrowed money, <laughs> we would intend to pay it back. Right? But you're not supposed to consider the seventh year saying, oh, well, next year is the seventh year. So there's no way I'm going to give him a new plow this year because he won't be able to pay it back by next year. So I'm not going to give it to him. Right? This passage is saying, do not do that. Do not close your hand because he might not pay it back. Give it to him, expecting him to pay it back, but knowing that he might not and be okay with that. So provide for their basic needs, whether your poor brother needs food, whether he needs tools, lend him whatever he needs. Hoping that he'll pay it back. <laughs> but if he doesn't, you need to be okay with that. That's what an open hand means. All right. Let's go over here and pick another one. Edie, do you want to pick one up there? Tithes or alms? Tithes? Which one? Tithes. One, two, or three? One. Tithes for 100. Now, uh, what do you think are tithes? I don't know. You don't know? Mm -hmm. Any guesses? Anybody know what a tithe is? <coughs> Our kids need some education. <laughs> a tithe is super cool, and I'll tell you where it comes from. Because tithes 100, we go all the way back to Abraham. The very first tithe the story of a tithe. Abraham moved to a new country as well. He left, he took everything he could carry and he went to a land that God told him to go to. And he started making friends there. And then there was a war. And five kings came and attacked four of the kings in his neighborhood. And his, his neighbors were defeated. And he was a shepherd out in the countryside, so it didn't really bother him. Except that, along with all the things that the five kings took, they took his nephew and his nephew's family. So Abraham gathered up a few of his friends, and he went after them. And they were able to get everything back. Everything that the four kings had lost. So four cities, he got it all back, Abraham and his friends. And as he came, as he brought all of the stuff back, the first person he met was a strange fellow named Melchizedek, who was priest of God Most High. Uh, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed are you by the God Most High, and blessed be the God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham immediately turned to him and gave him a tenth of everything that he had just gotten back. That's the first example of the tithe. And the actual word in Hebrew, in our Jewish culture for a tithe, it actually means tenth. And then Abraham's grandson, Jacob, Jacob had some family issues, and he had to run out of town. 
and he didn't take much with him and he had a dream one night that he was on a holy spot he wasn't a very religious person but he had a religious experience and when he woke up the next morning he looked up into the heavens and he said god whatever you do for me Every, anything that happens as I go to get a wife, as I go to start a family, as I go to try and build up a flock, <laughs> everything that you do for me, I promise I will give you a tenth back. And that was the second tithe. So one, Abraham gave God a tithe from the victory that he had just had. And the second time, Jacob promised that everything God will do in the future, <coughs> Jacob promises to be faithful in giving a tenth back. Those are the first examples. And we're going to... I'll have you guys work on this for me. Um, can you guys make a long row of lollipops? Maybe if you could put all of those in a long row right here. Can you, oh, there you go, you're started. Okay, so we can imagine like if our family went off to battle and we won all of the rewards, all the treasure, and we're bringing all the treasure back. We're going to look and see what we give back to God. Or if this is our family farm, and this, and we, it's a lollipop farm, <laughs> and this is our harvest this year. And while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to ties for 200 because I want to get through all the tithes because it's really cool stuff. The, uh, I'll have a question for you guys first though. If God doesn't provide anything, how much is our tithe going to be? Zero, right? <laughs> if God doesn't give us victory, if God doesn't give us a harvest, if God doesn't give us any income this month, how much do we have to tithe? Nothing, <laughs> Nothing right? <laughs> You're free. Now, you, that shouldn't make you happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you didn't make anything this month or this year. That's not a good thing. <laughs> now, as... As Abraham's family grew and became a nation and as they went back to Abraham's land and they started their country, they set up lots of rules. And this is the problem, is that people think rules are bad, <laughs> and they're not. Rules are actually to help us have better relationships <laughs> with each other. So now all of Abraham's great-great-great-grandkids, like us, as we're moving back into the land. Now, we've heard stories, but we don't remember, and, and of, because we're human, we're going to ask questions like, uh, well, what about, what if, what if I made interest? Do I have to pay tithes on the interest as well? Uh, what if, you know, the, people will ask questions, well, do I have to pay tithes on this? Well, do I have to pay tithe on this? Well, do I have to pay tithe on that? So as we're moving back to our country, we got all kinds of rules. And they're rules to help us understand what the tithe is and how we're supposed to do it. So, in Leviticus 27, he specifies that the tithe is on everything we have that grows. Now, if we're a Jewish family, what kinds of things do we have? Um, crops. Yeah, we have crops. What kinds of crops? Um, wheat. Yeah, good answer. Do you guys know any crops? Potatoes. Potatoes, it's possible, it's possible. They're gonna have wheat, they're going to have uh, 
I don't know where they got their oil from, but oil was an important ingredient. Olive oil, yeah, olive trees. So they had orchards, they had grapes, and they made wine. They had uh, all kinds of crops, right? So uh, hopefully they didn't have squash. Our family, our family doesn't have any squash. <clears throat> what else did a Jewish family have that grows? Yes, animals, lots of sheep. Now they may or may not have cows. They probably had a few oxen, right, for working. They probably didn't have any horses. I don't. Maybe they had chickens. They didn't have pigs because that was one of the rules. <laughs> goats and sheep. So Leviticus 27 says that a tithe comes from all of your produce. Now that includes plants, all of your crops, as well as all of your animals. So basically you tithe on everything that multiplies. Everything that multiplies, you pay a tithe on. And that makes sense because where does the multiplication come from? It comes from God, right? You can feed your, your cow and you can make him fat and happy, but you can't make him multiply. Only God does that kind of work. So, we know what we're supposed to tithe on everything that we have that grows and multiplies. How are we supposed to tithe? Now, when we are getting ready to tithe, now I need... A uh, couple helpers over here. I need someone to count out tens. One of you. <laughs> and I need somebody. Uh, can you help me collect lollipops? Excellent. You're awesome. <laughs> Are you going to help? <laughs> Over here. All right. So starting here, we're, you're going to count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And whenever they get to 10, I want you to pick up that lollipop. Okay? Now this is what a Jewish family did with their crops and their animals. With the tithe, it didn't matter if the animal was perfect or not. Now with the offerings, the offerings had to be your best. The offerings had to be perfect. But the tithes, you just went through, and every tenth sheep, every tenth goat, every tenth zucchini, <laughs> and you collected all of those, and you stored them up for a year. Hopefully you had a, a big, cool cellar. <laughs> And the whole family would store up all their tithes for the whole year. And then do you know what they had to do with their tithes? They had to take it to the temple. They had to take it to where God's presence dwelled. <coughs> now as you're looking at these guys, so they're taking every tenth lollipop does that seem like too much to give to God? God, whether it was Abraham, right, and all the treasure he got back from his battle, whether it was the Jewish families as they were growing crops and animals, God gave them a hundred percent, and then he asked for them to give him ten percent back. God said, this is my portion. The tenth. Now, it doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, if I were God, I would say, you all keep 75%. <laughs> I'll give you 75% and I'll take 25% off the top. <laughs> uh, it doesn't make sense to say, here's 100%. Here's all of it. I mean, think of Adam and Eve and the best birthday ever. Here's the whole world, and all of it is abundant and multiplying and growing. It's all 100% yours. Now, give me 10% back. 
Okay, so how many do we have here? We, it's, we have about 15 or so. 15 lollipops. So we have a line all the way across the church of lollipops. Very nicely done, by the way. Good job, family. <laughs> And this, this is how many we're supposed to give back to God. Does that seem like a lot or a little? A little. A little. A little. A little. It probably depends on the time of month or the time of year. You guys have probably eaten all your Halloween candy already, haven't you? <laughs> See, if we save the tithe for the end of the year, right, if we eat all of our lollipops, then this is going to seem like a lot of lollipops. <laughs> but if we do it at the beginning, if we take it first, 10% does not seem like very much at all. So they would gather they would gather their tithes that they've been saving up all year, and they would take it to the temple. And when they got to the temple, they would give it to the Levites. And here is an interesting passage in Numbers 18. That God is saying how he wants to use his portion. The Lord said to Aaron, who was a priest, You shall have no inheritance in their land. Neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for the service that they do. So this is interesting. We didn't talk about what kind of family we are, which tribe we're from. So if we were from any of the 10 tribes, 10 or 11 tribes, then we would be a regular Jewish family and we would farm like everybody else. But... If our family was from the tribe of Levi, then we're not allowed to have a farm. We have no land. We have no farm. Instead, we're supposed to serve God and Him alone, whether we serve in the temple or later in a synagogue. And the only way that we can survive in this new country is if all the farmers bring their tithes to us and then we get this many lollipops. Now, a regular farming family gets this many lollipops <laughs> and our family is going to get this many lollipops, but we're going to get it from all the other farming families. So it's going to add up. And we're also going to use this tithe to do our service for God. It's interesting that God says, this is my portion, and then he gives it away again. <laughs> this is my portion. You give it to me. And as soon as he gets it, he turns and says, I want to give it to them. <laughs> this whole system of giving is how God has supported his people, the people who have been especially called to serve him from ancient times until today. The tithe is, is really a social support. It's how we stay as community together and how we keep God at the center of our community. The tithes are supposed to bring us together. It brings our family together as we work to store up our tithes, as together we carry it to the temple, and as we present it to the Levites. And you know what we do when we get to the temple and give it to the Levites? We have a party <laughs> with our tithes. So say, uh, just in today's context, an average person in, in Redmond, Oregon makes about $40,000, give or take. So 10% of that would be $4,000. So if once a year, if we were to carry $4,000 to the temple, if there was still a temple, or to the church here, we would, we would throw a $4,000 party. Now, that's a big party. <laughs> and we would share in it, right? We would have a small part of that, 
but the Levites would get everything that was left over, which was quite a lot. If you have a $4,000 potluck next week, <laughs> if we were to have a $4,000 potluck, we'd probably eat about $300 of it, <laughs> and the rest would stay with the church. That's what the tithe is. Everyone who gives to the church gives a very small por portion, and we get to enjoy it every week. I, in, I really like these mountain things that Caleb did. Every week I watch them and I like when the colors change. Sometimes they don't and that bums me out. <laughs> but, I, I love the lighting. I love the sound of the music. I love worshiping. There are so many things <laughs> that I enjoy and our family, our family contributes to that. We, we paid for these lights. I mean, we paid a small little portion, but we, we help pay for the mountains. We help pay for the music. We help pay for everything that we get to enjoy every Sunday morning together. And in that way, we're contributing to building our community. And that's what it was in ancient times. Every family shared a special portion, and they were building community together as God's people. Now, because of time... I want to skip to tithes for 700 because I think it's really important for us to look at what Jesus said about tithes. Was Jesus for or against tithes? What do you think? Tithes, it was an Old Testament custom, right? Was Jesus for tithes or against tithes? <laughs> Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? So Jesus was not against tithes, but what did he have to say? And he didn't say much about the tithes. But in Luke 11:42, he was talking to the religious leaders, and he was angry at them. <laughs> and he said, You tithe mint and rue and your herbs but you neglect the justice and love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You know, he says things so simply, <laughs> but he's saying so much. You know, he could have gone off on them. Right, he, he could have said even more. He could have said, yes, I, I know, the, the prophets have already said to our people, that you're ungrateful, you're unselfish, and every day you are robbing God's portion by not giving it to Him. There are so many people who are ungrateful and, and selfish towards God, right? Their soul towards God, where they return nothing back to Him, and that's the danger when, you, when you're not counting your tithes, right? How many of our families in this church know how much tithe they've given this year? What portion have we given back to God from our incomes, from our things that have multiplied? Do we know? Are we counting? The danger with not counting is that we are probably even way more ungrateful and selfish than we even think we are. <laughs> That's the problem with not counting. But as Jesus was addressing these religious leaders, he was saying there's also a problem from counting your tithes. Because they were not only, they were saying, not only do you count your potatoes and your zucchini and your sheep and your goats, but these guys were super counters. They were even counting their herbs, leaves of mint, every little thing. They were counting and they were making sure that they were giving 10%. And Jesus looked at them and said, you're absolutely, you're completely missing everything. Because what did the tithes mean? Not what was their form. Okay, the form was a tenth. It's always been a tenth. You understand the form, but you don't understand the meaning of the tithe. By counting, 
You have completely overlooked your sense of sharing in support of the community, and you're still ungrateful and selfish. You give a full tenth of everything, and you're still absolutely ungrateful and selfish. Because you've forgotten that a tithe is meant to build the community of God's family. It's meant to bring us together in celebration for what God has done for our people. You're completely missing everything that the tithe was meant to do. It was meant to bring us together. Giving is unifying. Giving is unifying. Now the problem is that most people think of tithes as more of offerings. The tithes were often shared. Offerings were given to the temple and the temple alone. Offerings are centralizing. <laughs> but tithes were unifying. They built community through what they were giving. Now I'm hoping this week to start a discussion in all of our families. <laughs> a discussion that will last through the month on um, what what portion does our family give to God? What do we give a portion on? Do we give a portion of God just on our incomes? Um, do we give Him a portion on our inheritance, on our interests, on our local gardens? <laughs> Should we, should we be bringing zucchini into the church? What does the tithe look like? How much should it be? Does, do your families even know what portion you're giving back to God? I, I was thinking, we're pretty faithful with our tithe, but I was just thinking, my kids don't know how much we give, or when we give, or how we give, or what our tithes are doing to build the family of God. My kids don't know that, because we don't talk about it. So I want to open up discussions about our giving, and I want to make it a faith exercise, okay? This is not a duty. This is a celebration. We have opportunities to take a very small part. God gives us 100%, and He wants us to give Him a portion back in order to build family together. What portion will your family give, and what will that look like this year? I want to mention two very specific things that as you talk about tithes in general, which by the way, uh, in my question and answer time afterwards, feel free to come with Old Testament questions about the tithe. <laughs> But uh, in my question and answer time afterwards, we're probably going to do alms because those are also really, really cool. But the two things I want to mention that as you begin these conversations with your families, we are in a new beginning for our church. And I'm really excited about it. There are some things that we need to take care of, and there are some things that are really weighing on my heart and on my soul related to giving. One, the first thing I know also weighed on Pastor Brad's heart. Uh, and one of the things that really drew us to Desert Song was hearing Pastor Brad tell all the stories about how God was providing for this renovation and getting us into this place. A place for his presence, a place for his family to grow. And the one thing I could tell that really weighed on Brad's heart was towards the end, we had, uh, we accrued about $18,000 of debt. Uh, we did this whole thing <laughs> with $18,000 of debt. And I know Brad exercised faith on a weekly basis, uh, working with subs and seeing this, this whole thing come together. And I really, I really feel like it's our time to exercise some faith to try and wipe out that debt so that Pastor Chuck can have a fresh beginning to establish a clear ministry budget and uh, transparency with how we're going to use our funds. I, I just, I really, I hate debt. 
and I think it's time for us, and we're going to work on a, a visual to, to show us making progress on how we're going to try and wipe that debt out, hopefully by Thanksgiving. <laughs> $18,000. The other thing that has really weighed on my heart since the park's wonderful presentation is the Siderno family. The Siderno's sold their house. <laughs> They gave everything. They moved to the Marshall Islands and they've been serving God there for how many years? Almost two. Two years. They've been there for two years serving God with all their heart and soul and mind and body and strength and they're still $700 a month short in their monthly support. We sent them. <laughs> They're serving God, right? They don't have a farm. <laughs> they don't have an income like all of our families do. It's, they're counting on us. They're counting on our tithes so that they can continue to have the support that they need to reach people with the gospel. $700 a month. So now I hope that next week, as we come, we're going to have some visuals to help us see uh, how our progress in giving towards reducing the debt for our church to get free by the end of the year, maybe by Thanksgiving. And we're also going to have a visual. See, we want to see the Siderno family fully funded. We want them to have full sales yeah. for ministry. And we're going to report on those every week as we go. Hopefully we'll have the debt paid off by Thanksgiving and we'll have the Sidernos fully funded by Christmas. These are ways that we can build family together. And I hope that you will take these conversations <laughs> and that you will be able to talk with your families, not in a way that teaches them that this is what we're supposed to do, this is our duty, these are the rules, but this is God's portion. He's been so, so good to us this year, this month, this week. This is God's portion. We're going to give it back to Him and we're going to celebrate it and we're going to see Him build a family. And I just pray blessings upon you as you go, as you continue to look at His Word, as you continue to experience family and turning money issues not into bad problems <laughs> but into joyful opportunities may god bless you as you go and may he be faithful and generous to you as you work through these as a family have a great week